So may I have a round of applause for Mike? Thank you. It's, uh, connected. I tested this out. This is the fastest uh, system ready I've ever had on a projection system. So this is fantastic. <clears throat> Take notes so I can duplicate it back at my own office. Okay, um, I think I'll, can everybody hear me? I'm, all right, okay. Um, yeah, again, my name's Mike Oren. Um, I'm a robotics engineer. I have been for the past 13 years. And uh, I actually started my career in uh, industrial robotics. I worked for an industrial robot company uh, from Switzerland and uh, lived over there for a while. So I got to experience, um, I think, Something that not everybody gets to experience, even within the industry, I got to see not only how, uh, you know, working in a different country, which is always different, but I also got to see how, you know, other areas approach automation. You know, it sort of became the bug that uh, I was constantly seeking to, problem I, I was constantly seeking to fix. So um, I kind of got a little philosophical about it, you know, because we, you know, I went into a, a sort of a commercial environment in the sales. Working with customers at customer sites, you tend to get a lot of feedback, a lot of uh, uh, critical feedback sometimes about uh, what you're trying to do. And I, I think it was very, very helpful and very powerful. Um, it has been later on in my career. So currently, I've, I've switched out of industrial robotics, but you'd never really leave uh, robots. Once you're in, uh, you're in. <laughs> That's the way I, I, I see it. And the, the bug is still there, and I still get to work with the same product, actually, believe it or not that uh, I actually sold the robot to myself, <laughs> if, if that makes any sense. <laughs> I, I worked for the company, sold the robot, then went to work for the company I sold the robot to. So the company I work for today is called Restoration Robotics. And previous titles uh, I've had are like uh, application engineer or uh, sales engineer or project manager uh, with my industrial auto automation company, a company called Stoibli, you may, may have heard of it. Um, but now I'm a clinical development manager, so real big career shift um, for a company called Restoration Robotics, which is building a robotic system to do hair <laughs> transplantation. So um, I'll talk a little bit about that, but I'm also going to talk about mainly um, where industrial robots are, are working in surgical environments. They're becoming tools um, because they're very stable machines. And we'll talk a little bit about that and why, why they make sense and why they don't make sense. Mm -hmm. So got, I've got a lot of video content. I hope the audio uh, works. We'll adjust the volume as, as necessary. Um, and so let's get started. So a few goals for the presentation. Uh, hopefully you'll leave this uh, presentation with maybe learn something you've never seen before, see something you've never seen before. So um, also I'm just going to give, it's really an awareness presentation. It's not a highly technical presentation. I'd be happy to field technical questions for what I'm familiar with. Uh, I haven't worked for all these companies you're going to see, but uh, I am familiar with some of them more than others, so I'd be happy to field questions about that. And uh, maybe you'll have some new conversation starters. I, I, uh, uh, these, these are products that uh, may impact you one day, it'll probably impact somebody you know at least, or somebody, um, uh, a friend of a friend, as they say. Um, they impacted me, one of the products in here, um, basically uh, made it possible for a close relative of mine to Instead of being in bed for a week, they were walking the next day. Uh, that kind of impact. So it's a, it's a, um, some of these products really touch you in a way. It's it's not a technical thing. It's just a it's a personal thing. So um, let's see if this works. Uh, there we go. All right. So why automate? Um, it's in the title of the presentation, and it's uh, it's not something a term used often with medical robotics. I found surgical robots because. Um, you really are never going to take the, as far as I can tell, the physician out of the picture, right? The medical profession is very um, involved profession, and I don't see technology displacing that anytime soon. <laughs> okay, um, it's it's the technology right now is really empowering physicians to do things um, and have control and have all these different terms we're going to talk about uh, in ways that have never been the case before, um, and it's it's allowing for things like you know getting up after a day, right? You know, laparoscopic surgery. 
things like that. So, a few things I've over my career I've I've kind of sum, summarized. You know, what are the things I look for when when I try to automate something with a robot? Uh, it could be not with a robot. It could be with uh, hard tooling. You know, some sort of a conveyance system. You know, that's what robo industrial robots interact with. You know, an industrial robot sitting all by itself really doesn't do much for you. Uh, it takes end of arm tooling. It takes engineering. It takes conveyance, it takes getting parts in and out. Um, and the term, the, the, big, the big term you're going to hear throughout the presentation is, is relevant. You know, it's the question I ask. And, and relevance could be anything. Is it, does it, do you make enough of them to justify automation? That could be at the top of the food chain, you know. Um, but, you know, it can get into uh, detail things like, you know, uh, like my Kindle. You know, I can't think of a time in college where I, I asked myself, do I really need to bring my physics book to, to my class? Now I'm going to leave it behind. Of course, inevitably I need it, but with Kindle, I mean, I, I wish I had that years ago. That would have been great. I just take all my books with me. You know, I, same logic applies to automation. You know, does it make sense? You know, to to spend the money and, and do automation. Um, is it something you're repeating? You know, if you're only making one of something. Only the government I found does that. <laughs> you know, with uh, very specialized applications where they build a robot for one system and. Afterwards, um, it's no longer used. The, unfortunately, it's in the news, but you know the, the nuclear industry does that a lot. Uh, robots are disposable in the nuclear industry. We implemented robots in there. They implement it in a non-radioactive environment, and then it goes in there, and you never see it again. Um, is it refined? I think uh, automation. This is one that, that often gets missed. Um, that I've seen in my experience, uh, applications uh, are they? Is what you're trying to do something that you know, you understand? Are you trying to cut something with a laser? Are you trying to assemble something? Are you trying to you know how to do that well without a robot? Forget about the robot, you know? And refinement is, is a big part of that. So the video you're about to see is a video that I, I really love because it, it just takes you from the ground up. It's got audio. Uh, and it talks about uh, why something uh, has been automated. What, what, the, what all the... All the reasons are right up in front of you, so I'll just be quiet for a second. Enjoy the video. Complete wiring of control systems and sub-assemblies can now be accomplished with greater productivity within your organization. The CC-Matic from Vago provides complete and fully automated wiring when all components use Vago cage clamp terminals. The system is most efficient within switchgear cabinets and control systems where the percentage of wired connections with cross sections up to 1.5 square millimeters is over 90%. Previously, wiring was performed manually. For each point-to-point -point connection, the process was as follows. Each wire was individually stripped, connected, and then labeled. Wiring with cage clamp technology, as shown here, results in a clear time saving compared with historical screw or solder connections. The stripped and inserted wire is rooted within the cable ducts to the second connection and cut to the correct length. It is then stripped and supplied with the correct wire label and inserted. Finished. Time to complete approximately 40 seconds. Generally, the cage clamp connection technique does not require end sleeves for wires. However, they are quite often used, and this, of course, incurs additional time and expenditure. CC-Matic, the world's first automated wiring robot for the cage clamp connections, takes about six to eight seconds, dependent on the wire length, for point-to-point -point wiring with automatically dyed, labeled, and supersonically compressed wires. The input information for the CC-Matic system is generated automatically from the DDSC, one of the world's leading electrical design solutions developed by SIM Team. DDSC generates connection information from the schematic and panel diagram with wiring specific restrictions and transfers it directly to the CC-Matic controller. The basis for the automated wiring is the schematic diagram. In DDSC, parts and symbols are selected from the library and placed into the schematic diagram. Automatic checks are performed dynamically to ensure manufacturability. Examples of this include ensuring that duplicate use of a component element 
or incorrect terminal designations are not permitted. Electrical connections are then drawn with the manufacturing relevant attributes added as required. Again, online checks ensure that faults, such as short circuits, are automatically avoided. Information from the schematic diagram is then used to generate the control panel layout and wiring. First, automatic and manual placement of parts onto the mounting plate is carried out. Automated checks necessary for the robotic wiring are performed automatically. These include a minimum distance check between components and cable ducts. An option for automatic placements of components onto standard mounts provides extremely rapid creation of the mounting back plate. The next stage is to automatically wire the components based on connection information in the schematic diagram, routing paths, and actual component positioning. Here again, the system performs the necessary manufacturing relevant checks during wiring. DDSC calculates the fill degree level within cable ducts and searches for the shortest connecting route for wires, while avoiding areas where routing is not permitted. With the information generated, DDSC then calculates the paths for the robot, calculates part placement information, and then transfers wire color and wire labeling information directly to the CC Matic. The user doesn't need any knowledge in programming, but the CAD system acts as an automated programming station for the CC Matic. The optical system integrated into the wiring head of the robot provides a comparison between nominal and actual placement. In other words, between SIM Team's DDSC and CC Matic systems for providing error-free wiring. CC Matic is the revolution in automated circuit wiring enabled by the use of Vago's cage clamp technology. The cage clamp is used in Vago's modular terminal blocks, PCB terminals, plug connectors, transformer terminals, and interface units, as well as in Siemens Zerius low voltage controls. The next generation of automated electrical design for manufacturing, driven by DDSC, the system for electrical design and documentation from SIM team. So can anybody guess how old that video is? 25 years. years. <laughs> no. 14 years. Now the, the copy of Windows, the, the Windows <laughs> window might have been a, a giveaway. It was, uh, I think it was running Windows 95, that uh, software. So that software still exists? So that software uh, still exists, the product still exists, um, it's, uh, but it's pretty remarkable, you know, 14 years ago to me. I, I think that was, that, that, the application was done in, in Germany, and uh, it was one of those things where, you know, here we've got a, um, a problem to solve with uh, control panels. I mean, you're, it's a little bit limited to what you can use with it, but certainly if you saw it, imagine 40, 45 seconds each time that, that guy's cutting both ends and running them through the panel. Uh, and the panel's very repeatable. It's, it's, it's built on a CAD system and machine. So um, it's one of those situations where it makes sense. Um, the other question is why robotics? Because it's not necessarily when you automate something, are you going to use robotics or what you know, you consider a robot, especially in the industrial robotics um, arena. You know, there's all sorts of permutations that uh, came from, stem from the word robotics. Um, so, <clears throat> but when I think robotics, and if I'm going to use robotics in an application, the first thing that comes to mind is control. Okay, I need to, I need to bring something under control, or I need to add control to a process that I, it's very, it's very difficult to control. It could be a dangerous process. It could be uh, something that's, um, uh, has, you know, the, the parameters are very hard to adjust for a manual, you know, operation, things like that. Precision. Now. Uh, precision is a relative term. <laughs> you know, most industrial robots out there don't work in nanometers. Uh, they don't even really work in micrometers. Uh, you know, 20 microns is about the standard of uh, repeatability, meaning, you know, I, I tell a robot to go somewhere, I record that location, the encoders write that to memory, and then I go somewhere else and I come back and there's a complex algorithm for determining re repeatability. It's an 
ISO standard actually. It's, it's a regulated standard, so that you know one guy says my number is 20 microns, and the other guy says my number is 20 microns, and you ask who, which standard did you use? You know, but precision. And it's a, like I said, it's relative. But if you're thinking about a robot, you've determined control. This would be the next thing. And is it mature? You know, the application that you're looking at is it something you understand? Um, and I think that that's really important for. Uh, you know, especially a process application, which the, the, the next shorter video uh, sort of focuses on. But this is an application uh, where a robot was customized. It took an off-the-shelf robot, you know, and I, I really equate it to what's going on with this uh, Xbox Connect. Um, you know, it took it off the shelf and you're doing what you want with it. Uh, this was the same thing. A manufacturer came to my former company and uh, they wanted to do something unique with a robot that's absolutely never been done before. Never had this flexibility. That's a 2,000 watt laser uh, at the end of that robot. And that can blast through metal, plastic, all of it combined uh, at these kind of speeds. That's a car dashboard. And uh, the, the reason this application uh, is justified is it's, first of all, fast, but also you know, cars that are built on islands are typically right-hand drive. Cars that are not built on islands and continents are, are typically built uh, left-hand drive. So, either way, you want to sell your car worldwide. So one way or the other, you're going to make a car of the opposite type. So what happens often is manufacturers will use this process for the lower volume product and use a, a punching machine for the higher volume product. Okay. And this can work on any dashboard. It really doesn't matter. You can teach this thing to work on uh, BMW X5 one day, which this may be. Uh, you can have it do a, a BMW X3 the next day. It doesn't really, doesn't really matter. Um, if, if, as long as you've programmed it, it can cut out the dashboard. This is a very tedious process. This used to be done by uh, hand in a lot of systems. Uh, since then, they use sort of a, a trimming machine. That just this whole heavy press comes down, and stamps out all the holes that you want. And uh, that's fast, but it's also extremely expensive. So they actually have to shoot um, uh, very cold air through the head. So that you, all that burning you see is actually the material after it's past the, uh, where it's being cut. The edge is perfect, there are no burn marks. So they actually uh, bl blow the, the material that's in instantly caught on fire, and that's the smoke you're seeing. So, Seems kind of weird the dashboard comes out looking so good after all that smoke was involved in making it. It's a combination. These are substrate um, substrates, so they take a metal frame um, for, for the, you know, the most of it from left to right, you know, where it's mounted in the car. Uh, so it's got a metal frame, and then over the top, they actually mold over a layer of a sort of foam. And on top of that, they put a, a sort of a hard, you know, real hardened, uh, it's really re resistant to sunlight uh, rubber. Whatever texture the this car is. Cutting the metal. Yeah, this is going through the whole thing. It's going through the, the rubber on the outside, through the, there's some hard plastic, then the foam, then all the way through the metal all at once. Yeah. So the third question is, okay, what you know, why, what are we talking about? Why medical robot? Well, I take a few things from the previous two slides, and one of which is is control. Okay, in, in the applications you'll see control is a is a plays a huge role. Precision, um, and precision is a very relative term in medical robotics because uh, some of these robots are, are not, they're not automatically controlled, they're controlled by somebody, a person. But what are you doing to that input right, to get your output? That's, that's where the, you, know, the, you can control the amount of precision you want in some of these applications. And is it relevant, of course. You know, and, and in medical robotics, of course, the robots are tested to even more requirements uh, from an efficacy, efficacy standpoint, right? Is it, is it proper for the market? Is it proper for the medical industry? And um, so we'll, let's start talking about medical robotics. Got a few applications to show you, and we'll talk about sort of uh, where we are today. This is going to be sort of the 40,000 foot view of where the mo mo medical robotics business is today. And I'm very proud to say that a lot of it is right here in Silicon Valley. Right here, and it's right here. I mean, literally, you could drive to all, most of all these companies. Uh, there's only one there out in Florida. Uh, but uh, I think it, it really says something, it really speaks to where we are. Um, so this is an application, we'll, we'll go into this one in a little bit more detail 
but uh, uh, this is suturing. Uh, suturing is a common part of any kind of repair or uh, anytime you want to close a wound. And uh, those are two robotic arms and on the top and on the bottom you can see uh, an operator actually so an operator actually controlling it. This is one of the first generation um, products from this company. This is Intuitive Surgical. Very famous hey. company here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> very cool. Um, so uh, I think you know what what they've what they've done is is just extremely um, special in terms of the, the power they give in physicians. You know, I've I've been in a couple hospitals just talking to physicians that I know use this machine, and then just their feedback is is, is incredible. Um, so let's let's just look at a, a few medical robot products. So there's a couple of categories. It's sort of telerobotics. And then there's another category of, of um, semi-automated. Uh, so intuitive surgical is considered a telerobot, even though it's very localized. You know, the table might be over there, the, the operator is right here. Um, and uh, that's a laparoscopic type of, of robot. So you're trying to minimal, minimally invasive, minimal entry into the area that you want to work on. Another company called Hanson Medical. Uh, actually, I misspelled that. It should be S-E-N. Um, and uh, that is a catheter guidance machine. Uh, it's, a, it's a smaller footprint device, but uh, it, it does what it does very well. And then there's, this, I put it in the category of assisted surgery, okay? And uh, there's a company out in Florida, a company called Mako Surgical, and Mako is doing uh, an orthopedic uh, type robot. And what's interesting about this robot is it's really not, a, it's actively controlled but it's the physician that drives the process. You know, it's not saying go and stop. It's actually the physician is, is, is kind of guiding the robot. They're moving the robot, but the robot's constraining where they want to work, which is, uh, I think, a very unique solution. The company I actually share a building with, <laughs> it's right down the street, um, but their headquarters is down in Sunnyvale. It's going to be called Accurate. It's uh, radio surgery. And I think this is the closest to the company I work for in terms of if you were to look at an uh, a image because this is actually, you cannot hide it, it's right there. It's a huge industrial robot that's uh, got some covers on it, but it's actually carrying a very heavy uh, 450 pound or so um, linear accelerator on the end. And then there's my company. We're, we're doing uh, something with also an industrial robot, very sophisticated. Um, in terms of imaging, you know, each, each, each of these applications sort of has a you know a major unique trait, um, and what we're doing is hair transplant patients. So we're working on a very small level, uh, and we, we're actually able to harvest hair out of the back of uh, men's head <laughs> and uh, transplant. Okay, we're, we we do part of the transplant process, not the entire procedure. Uh, but the part that's the most difficult to control for somebody with their hands. It's that's the hardest to teach. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more. So um, just going to touch on uh, sort of the some of the key points, right? And I'm I'm an outsider. I don't work for this company, but you know these are the key points I think that, that we think about when we think about each of these individual um, companies. And intuitive Surgical um, is really the ability to um, control a robot, control the machine that's that's over you know patient side working on the patient in, in a way that's, that's really unique. And, and what, it, what it comes down to is, uh, here you have a couple of frames, and this is what you're working on, this is your eye. And you know, your body is, is really calibrated. You know, if, I'm, if I'm turned this way and I'm, I'm moving this object, you know, it doesn't matter whether I'm looking at it or not, my body is sort of by feel calibrated to what that means, right? You know? And I can't really change that. So when I look under a microscope and I start trying to manipulate things with tweezers like we do in hair transplantation, little tiny hair follicles or little tiny tissue cords, okay, I see this thing zipping by because I'm just not calibrated to that level of magnification. What if you could take out that control uh, and, and, and provide an image, which is, this is what the physician would see in the, in the eyepiece, provide an image and also provide input and control and be able to separate the two and add whatever level of magnification I want, still have the same relative movement for what I see. Right? Does everybody follow? So basically, you're able to 
uh, edit. You're basically, you know, transferring so you get the same frame of reference that you would with no magnification, with no apparatus, uh, under under very high magnification, and uh, be able to work that way. So, so what you see, you know, when I move the object, I see in the camera is is exactly what I'm feeling in the controls. Okay. And uh, this is really what what I, I think the makes this really innovative. You know. um, Actually, your hands are moving further because you have a gauge. You're seeing an identifying right. image okay. and. And, and the, the end effectors, the, the clamp, or whatever you're manipulating, moves exactly like you want it. But you're moving further from the masters on the left-hand side to actually accomplish that. And it's it's intuitive to you don't even you don't process that. It's this oh yeah I'm moving I'm moving stuff and five like minutes later you're a, you're running a machine. A device, yeah, yeah it's, that's it's incredible. So. Thank you for. Uh, I yeah I I've, I've seen this thing. I I, uh, I used to um, I watched the training, you know, at a, at a show. Where you know you, you could actually walk up. Yeah, I think you had to talk with somebody. You could walk up and, and try it out. You walk up, put your hands on it, and do stitching. Yeah. And that's, that's, Incredible. that's no exaggeration. Uh, question: Does it attempt? Uh, does it attempt to do something like resist the motion if the uh, uh, mechanism itself is getting resistance uh, due to uh, you know, something being harder? I heard there's some haptic. Sort of it's not really haptic. You you can collide instrument mm -hmm. and. It won't prevent you, although there's a, a limited force, so you won't totally destroy things. But so you can like keep pushing, and eventually the robot just stops moving, taking your. Yeah, it just it yeah. just isn't going to go if you're yeah. if you're up against a stop or something. Like that. Yeah, and I think that's a major part of the you know one of the efficacy things you have to consider with a product like this, right? You know, what is the what is the, what can the machine handle? You know, what are the what are its limits? How do I set those limits? And how how different are the hand motions and stuff that the surgeon has to make? I'm not a surgeon, so I, I, I really can't make a comparison. It basically uh, translates. You've yeah. got seven degrees of freedom, so you're 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 rotating that that uh, clamp, for example, or, or you're moving it back, or you you're, you've got uh, two fingers in those in little uh, little hoops there, and you open and close the jaws if it needs it, or rotate it. So you, you, just about what it can do, it's it's. Uh, it's, I'd say it's, it's real uh, intuitive to the operator. How, much, how long do the people typically have to be trained to use it? Well, a surgeon is going to get quite a few hours. They probably already have training as a surgeon, obviously. Sure. Probably already have some laparoscopic experience, so they know what they're going to do, what they're, what, how they're going to do the, the organ or whatever. But uh, we, and there's a, actually there's a, a training simulator that you can sit on, and I don't know how many hours they run on it. Neighborhood of 20 hours, maybe something like that. It's a, or this, I see some of the pictures have not one but two consoles. So you have a a, a, a practice surgeon on one, and, and he lets some another one work with him alongside, and he can correct him and, and direct him and so forth. They can trade back and forth. Or you can have two qualified surgeons running three arms plus the uh, plus the camera. So you get. Yeah, the camera on this thing is unbelievable. It's 3D, you're actually, it's a three-dimensional view. That box is what it's generating for you. Yeah, it's HD. Also. And HD, yeah. yeah. I saw this, this yeah. the latest video, it had the, the HD. And then it's got all these, you know, they can record, they've got all these outputs, they can record the video, the, the procedure. I mean, just an incredible level, level of detail you would never get uh, before. So this is just a, uh, I can, there you go. That's, so that's the console, that's the surgeon's console. Um, so, each surgeon that, like, where um, somebody I know had a, had a surgery, um, I, I did talk to the physician a little bit, was talking about, you know, they have settings for their their preferences, how they want the machine to behave, where the, the head unit is, so there's not a lot of setup, it's not like getting into a car for the first time every time they want to use it. This thing remembers you know, all their settings and preferences. So those are the, yeah. Those are the controls. You can see there's the two robot arms, and so the the patient side person actually can load different instruments as they're going along. They've got a tray full of different <coughs> instruments. If they want a different hand or gripper or tool. Uh, they can load those. Here's a cautery tool. Cautery tool. Yeah. Hmm. It's nice that it's on a micro level. <laughs>
So this is, you know, suturing. This, this is the, for me, I mean, as a, as a non-surgeon, the, sort of the take-home application when you watch this, you know. So this is, this is sort of a training model. Right? You can have a, a model under magnification and they can train you on it. It's just a foam backing with some silicone rubber or something on the top. There's actually a computer simulation now for this training console I was talking about, so it's all Oh, you cool. sit on the same uh, surgeon console and operate it, but you're, it's, a, it's a graphical simulation. You see two instruments, which look, you know they look they look like they're uh, CGI, and uh, the object and so forth. But you manipulate the uh, you know. so pan the view. You can pan your camera view. This is what the robot looks like from the outside. You've got all these arms working away, and so these these instruments pop out. You see the little blue cartridge that just. They just pop out and they've got all the controls wired in. At some point you have to separate what you put in the autoclave and sterilize and what stays you know, in the room. That's, that's where they make that separation. So high def video, they can record, they can throw this up on a monitor, uh, send it somewhere. Yeah, that's a, that's a Is there a latency between when they make a movement and when it actually? Nothing perceptible. It's just you're right there. No. You're, it's your hands inside, except they're, you, that little instrument is about that big on the end compared to what appears to be like like that big in the view. You've got stereo view and you're looking into it. You're just, just like you're working. There's no way. It's all hardwired from the you know, vision tower, the console, all the way over to where they see the they work it. High speed connection. What's, what's the ratio of movement? So if you move your, your finger an inch, how, how far does the distance move? I think it depends on your zoom factor. What, what yeah, I, I'm going to say four to one might be yeah. one that they use a lot, to, okay. to, but I think that's so it's settable. So, uh, so another interesting um, product is, uh, is, is this distal catheter, and this is a teleoperated. So I'm not that familiar with catheters myself, but I, uh, what, what I do know is it's, uh, it's, a, <laughs> it's a procedure you have to be very careful from the standpoint of puncturing through important tissue. Right? It's, a, it's, a, it's basically a flexible you know, rod that you're, you're sticking in, and a lot of times you, you do work on the, on the heart, so you need to go through one of the main arteries to get to it, and you're doing it on the inside of the heart wall. So it's very, you know, you're dealing with, with organs that are very sensitive, and you this product um, is it goes into the control category again, as, as do all these. Where you know what is the point of control? And in this case, what they're doing is they're controlling. They're able to sense and provide feedback as to the pressure that you're applying with with the end. Okay. And so that's it's basically going you know looping around and making contact with the interior of the heart muscle. And the, the control of this thing is very interesting. Uh, it's, a, it's sort of, a, it's got three, um, three sort of plates here that are of course tied into it, encoders. And it's, it's got a ball on the end and it's connected to, it's a three link mechanism. So it's got three links and you can control, you know, just like that. It's like, it's like a, a spatial joystick. Yeah, and you steer it through them, is that what Yeah, it's basically, and, and, and it provides you the control of the tip. You you basically aren't steering it all the way to the target position. It's, it's once you get there, you're actually doing your work where you want that fine control. It's only controlling the end of the, the catheter tip. The actual part that gets this device there is, is, is fixed. You know, you, you, you use the tip to sort of hunt your way to where you're going. And, and then once you get there, you, uh, you have control of the tip and you manipulate it with this device. So again, it's designed to be intuitive so that what you see on the monitor is what you, what you get. You can change uh, resolution similarly to the intuitive system. You can get finer control or coarser control depending on the preference of what you need. Uh, but you're also, at the same time, the, the big key message here is you're getting feedback as to what's going on, you know, how much pressure you're applying. Because, you know, you've got some information that's provided you by the system. This is an actual example so but you're working with you know like an x-ray or a, you know, a 
a scan image or something like that, and they've got that, that live view there, you see the beating heart. So it, it provides an added level of feedback, added level of control to the physician that you wouldn't have without a tool like that. So the probe tip has what a camera in it? Yes. Yeah, and it also it's it's got whatever device you're, you're using on the tissue. You know, a lot of times with heart surgery, you're making uh, uh, because you know hearts. It's, it's a complex muscle. It's got different different tissue from other muscles, and so what you're doing is you're a lot of times you're actually sort of um, you know scoring or I don't know what the exact medical term is, but you're. you're damaging certain parts of the muscle because they're providing erratic, uh, they're, they're contributing to an erratic heartbeat. Okay. And so you need to, you need to, you need to manipulate it in such a way, you, you, and you need feedback, like you need the, you need a, 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 that's why they've got all these you know, electrical connections to the heart and in and around the heart muscle because they're basically monitoring that to see, to get the feedback they need to do whatever they're else they're going to do in the procedure. So this is uh, this 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 system is a little bit more towards where, where I come from in, in robotics. Um, it's, it looks a little bit like a robotic arm you might see in an assembly line or something like that. But the uh, the Mako robot really isn't, isn't a motorized machine. It doesn't have uh, actively controlled motors. You can't instruct it to move somewhere. Um, but it's it's a constraint device. So if you want to in, in, in surgery when you're doing cutting bone, doing implants, um, you're having to make space for the implant to seat. Okay, you're having to make, you know, cut the bone, cut the bad, the diseased bone out, and replace it. So that cut, when it's done by hand, there's a certain control issue, because you're basically dealing with a tool that is analogous to a, you know, a, a die grinder, a chisel. Yeah, it really is, it's a loud process. I've actually seen this done. It's a, it's, it's surprisingly loud considering you're in a surgical environment, right? It's, it's bone. And, and it's, uh, so it, it's also very easy to overcut. You have to make a certain amount of space. Uh, the more space extra than from compared to the implant, the more healing time. Bone's gotta grow back, all right? So what this device does is kind of interesting is it's providing a, a, a laparoscopic, so you minimally, you know, minimize the amount of cutting you need to do to the outside tissue to get to it. Um, but when you want to make a, a cut in the bone to make room for the implant, it provides, the, the doctor is actually moving the robot and the robot is actually only constraining to the determined cutting pattern that they want. Okay, so you can move left. If he wants to do a left-right pattern first or up and down first, it's only constraining to the volume that you've set and it's a six degree of freedom robot, so it can work in, in space at any angle. So you can you can control this, and it does that in real time. So it's, uh, um, I think a, it's, a, it's a unique application of robotics, but it's really, it's, it's, by itself, it's not a moving robot. <laughs> so this kind of give you an idea. So the robot sits off to the side, they prepare the patient, they're gonna make a, an incision. This is a, a drill. Okay, so they hold it just like they would a drill, but the drill not just being connected to the physician, it's also connected to this, this robot. And so they take scans of uh, different layers and basically build a model so the system has on lines previewing, knows what the bone looks like in reality, and knows what it needs to cut out of the bone to fit this implant in. And uh, so it's putting two and two together to build a, cons a space constraint for the robot. Physicians driving the process the entire time. Do you know if that's just knee or the hip? Or the other uh, they're they're focused on knee. Yeah, okay. uh, hip is a, a different kind of. It is really a whole different animal, from what I understand. <coughs> yeah, <laughs> they're making semiconductors or something. <laughs> 
So uh, here's a couple, a couple more applications, the final two applications. One is the, uh, the Accuray machine. And uh, this, this company, uh, and this is a really interesting machine. It, it's really, um, really combining it. You've got an industrial robot that's doing what it really does best, um, being repeatable and precise and flexible, those three, three characteristics. And it really is a good fit. <laughs> Uh, even for me, I knew nothing about radio surgery before, before I heard about this product. But it, it, what little I did know, it was an immediate, it, it just made sense, and I'll show you why. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about our company. We're, we're in the process of, of getting a product to market, so there's not you know, a whole lot of detail I can, I can show. We're um, in the process of um, finalizing our product. But I'll, I'll give you a, a brief you know, tour of what we do. So the Accuray system is, um, this is, there's a lot of heavy machinery here. You've got, uh, this is a, called a robo couch, and it can actually carry the weight of all the stuff on the end, plus the patient itself. And this, this machine, it, it's, it, originally that wasn't part of the original system. Originally it was just the robot arm and the linear accelerator you see on the end of the robot arm. But uh, this adds, now you have, you have 12 degrees of, of, of freedom in this system. So you have a, a six-axis, there's, there's a six-axis robot here, all rotary joints, and then you have a six-axis robot here with a single uh, vertical joint at the base. So you've got 12 degrees of freedom, so you can really have a lot of flexibility and you can provide the patient a comfortable position to sit in, and this thing can, can attack tumors is what it's designed to do. It's, uh, and again, I'm not a radio surgeon, but what I understand about radio surgery is it's a statistics game. Okay, when you have a tumor that's treatable by external radio surgery, you, uh, you're, you're, the old days you would have this big device, this big apparatus, and you would have relatively large doses of, of radiation in each pulse, in each sitting, because they, they had limited flexibility in how they could position you, especially if it was your head or your spine. You know, they're really limited. They've got, uh, they've got to put a target behind you, and they've got a system that can produce radiation. You've got to be placed somewhere in the middle. It wasn't a whole lot of flexibility. It was very uncomfortable. And uh, you also ran the risk of, you know, you don't want to, you try to want to avoid damaging good tissue. Uh, you're only going after the tumor. And so that's why it's a statistics game. The idea of the cyber knife is it uses a, a lower um, power radiation. But because it can approach so many different angles, it's a, you know, it's again, 12 degrees of freedom. So you have you know, incredible flexibility. This machine can position both the tumor and the robot and the source and all these different orientations and attack it from many, many different sides. So does it actually destroy and re remove the tumor or is it just no, radiation? No, it's only it's radiation So it's treatment. still radiation therapy, but it's arc therapy plus, yeah. right? It's, pra it's, it's, you know, what you'll see in this video is this is, this is really how it is. I mean, they, there's no like, uh, <coughs> it might be surgery, but you know, you just have to change it into slightly different clothes and lay down on a table. There's no knives or no numbing or anything like that. And so this thing, the way it gets feedback is there's a, uh, pause that. The way it gets feedback is there are two sources of, of x-ray on the top and then there's detectors on the floor. So it's constantly getting feedback about where the tumor is, okay? And it's able to use that information and they can match it to the fixed CAT scans that they already took and they get better targeting information in real time while they're going. It also can track your breathing. Tumors near the chest, the neck, the back, the head, they move. So how are you gonna do that? They have these uh, stereo, um, they put some sensors on your chest or whatever's gonna be uh, targeted. And they actually, uh, using these sensors in the, in the ceiling, they can monitor that and the robot will have a slight shift as it's, as it's treating. So it's very, very cool. So yeah, this is this is how it works. There's no contact made with the patient. It's just a robot moving around. It's all radiation. So there's nothing you can see. And this is the old way. They have to actually put your head in a fixture if they're going to treat the head. And it's they're limited in how, how they can mount that fixture. Whereas the so robot's you, not. You said it had a linear accelerator as opposed to a radioactive source. Yes, that's right. Yeah. It's, it's, so it generates the radiation. It generates the radiation, yeah. What's uh, MEV of the uh, 
It's already, I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's lower than the typical, um, the big machines you would see at typical oncology. I know that. So it's producing x-rays, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, if you have an accelerator, you have more control over what direction the x-rays are going in than if you had a radioactive source. Good point. That would be one reason. These are tungsten. I know the tips, they can actually now pick up different tips to shape it better. So it has a, a and these things are so heavy. I went and picked one of these things up. I mean, it, it's this block of tungsten. Ooh, you know, it's like a, it's just a, incredibly heavy, but the robot's like, I don't care. It's a 300 kilogram payload robot. It, there's no, it's already got a humongous linear accelerator in the end of the tungsten, but it's just a little bit added weight option for chemotherapy um, and this allowed us now to offer them something that wasn't uh, available before that wasn't uh, only effective but was safe unlike other systems on the market the cyberknife system images continually throughout the treatment and automatically corrects treatment delivery for even the slightest tumor or patient movement throughout the body this unique ability is important for treating tumors that move particularly those in the spine lung liver, pancreas, and prostate. A lung tumor it moves constantly with respiration. Uh, conventional radiation, you'd have to radiate the whole area where the tumor might be in any phase of respiration, whereas a cyber knife, the radiation device actually tracks the tumor and allows us to give a very focused dose of radiation to the tumor and not the surrounding normal lung. Normal street clock. Unhindered by the clockwise, counterclockwise constraints of conventional gantry systems, the CyberKnife system's robotic mobility has significantly improved dose sculpting capabilities and conformal dose distributions. Unlike the conventional radiation machines, the CyberKnife literally can dance around the room. Those radiation beams can come in from the head of the patient, the feet of the patient, the sides at multiple different angles. That's something our conventional radiation machines, which are fixed, are not capable of doing. And as a result of that, we can get very high doses into the tumor and spare the normal tissue surrounding it. Prior to treatment, the patient is imaged using a high-resolution <coughs> CT scan to determine the size, shape, and location of the tumor. Following the scanning, the image data is digitally transferred to the CyberKnife System's treatment planning workstation, where the treating physician identifies the tumor to be targeted and the surrounding vital structures to be avoided. The CyberKnife software then generates a treatment plan to provide the desired radiation dose to the identified tumor location. Finally, during a CyberKnife procedure, the patient lies comfortably on the treatment table, which automatically positions the patient. Treatment generally lasts between 30 and 90 minutes. Prior to the delivery of each beam of radiation, the CyberKnife system simultaneously takes a pair of X-ray images and compares them to the original CT scan. This image-guided approach continually tracks, detects, and corrects for any movement of the patient and tumor throughout the treatment to ensure precise targeting. All right, so. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what we do at Restoration Robotics. This is a, a, a model of our industrial design for the process <coughs> of building up. Uh, we actually have a slightly different industrial design for the end of our tool. It won't have flat surfaces like that. It'll be curved like the rest of the system. But uh, the idea behind our system is um, a patient sits in this chair and their face sits in the face cradle, similar to a massage chair, something like that. And um, uh, if, you're, if you're familiar with hair transplant transplantation, you'll understand this. If you're not, I'll just give you a brief overview of what it involved. Um, the follicles in the back of your head and all around, okay, for men, uh, will be with you for the rest of your life. Okay. The follicles on the top. Not so much. <laughs> it's, all, it's all variable. That's, it's genetic as to when, when they uh, die off and if they die off. But it's, it's influenced by that. But it's DHT. DHT, which is uh, built off of uh, testosterone, which um, builds up in, in those areas and causes those follicles to, to die off or maybe just shrink. Sometimes they, they only shrink, continue to grow them. Either way, though, the hair here can be transplanted, though, up here and will grow. Um, you know, the, the, not all the follicles grow, but, you know, most of them will. And if uh, the, the nice thing about this is it's, 
allowing the physician to watch the video monitor and watch the harvesting process instead of doing it themselves because you have to you know, score out each individual follicle, the one millimeter needle, uh, coring punch, and you have to you have to score the back, of, you know, the head. If you're doing a thousand, it's a thousand times. You're doing fifteen hundred times, fifteen hundred times. Uh, it becomes a, a lot like that wiring job I showed at the beginning, <laughs> but lends itself. <laughs> it lends itself to automation readily. <laughs> okay, and uh, because not everybody's head is the same shape, we're not. You know, the, the, when they sit in here, they're awake. I mean, they can watch their iPod if they want. Uh, it's not like it's. I mean, they've, they've no, really no idea what's going on. We show them the system, but. Um, you know, while they're there, uh, they're going to be moving around a little bit. So, you know, we have to track that in real time. We're taking a, a one millimeter needle and we are going right over the top of a hair follicle within, you know, within what we need, right, to be able to capture it while a person's moving around. 50 frames per second, we're making that adjustment for every hair we see in the vision system. So, um, that's, and, and that's, that's where this, this product really is the upside, right? You've got it. You now have, for hair transplant surgeons, they can spend more time focusing on their procedure and practice than spending time doing FUE surgeries, which cost more. And it's called follicular unit extraction is the process that we're emulating. And uh, follicular unit extraction is the most time consuming and least performed, uh, but it's also the, uh, has the best um, cosmetic result from the standpoint of it's the least impact on the back of your skin. Now, I'm not going to go into what other forms of hair transplant surgery, but um, Vice President Joe Biden has, has had uh, a hair transplant, um, and for those who are familiar with the industry, you would, you would just know by looking at the um, But, you know, those different technologies have been very, varying levels of success, but FUE is really at the top, it's the top of the line, it's also the most expensive. Automate it and try and obviously bring the cost down. <clears throat> so, thank you very much. I think we're within, within time. Uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to stick around a bit and, and, uh, and answer them. Uh, this is a comment. People sometimes wonder if a computer has ever killed anyone. And the one example that I'm aware of was in a radiation treatment deal like that, where there was a subtle software error where the timing of some signal coming in and an interrupt happening and so on caused the accelerator not to shut off and the patient got cooked. Ouch. You know how long ago that was? Oh, 15, 20 years probably. I believe that was called on Therac 25 okay. uh, incident. Yeah, that's probably what it was. There's a Wikipedia page for it. That was a radiation treatment machine. That yeah. was That's around 91, right? Mm -hmm. That's around 91 or 92. I don't remember exactly. Yeah, I remember there's a one. Which machine? Varian, you said? Therac. T-H-E-R-A-C space 25. So what do you think's coming next in the, in, in the field of medical robots? I mean, you don't have to tell us anything secret. Oh. Can, you, can, you, can you speculate? Um, you know, I, I mean, there are different, I, I really, um, I think what we've seen so far um, have really opened the doors for a lot of different, I'm not going to try and dance around the question, but and I, don't, I don't really have a specific answer, but the, you know, what we've seen so far have really opened up a lot of doors into, you know, we've, we've got a big <laughs> robot application out there. So big, you know, that's a, that, that robot at one time, you know, there are, versions of that robot that are out there putting windshields on Volkswagens. <laughs> okay, I mean, that's, a, that's a, I think, a really big inroad in robotics, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's a medical system. Um, the, the efficacy is, is not so much the fact that it's an industrial robot, it's a, it's a whole system. And it's treated as a whole system. Um, in our machine, same way, it's, it's looked at and, and treated and regulated as a whole system, um, as one design. So, I, I you know, I, I think in the in the rain, in the world of, I think what's going what we're going to see next is attempts to adapt the robots more specifically to particular applications. Because there are other applications out there. There's skin applications. There's a, uh, if you've ever seen a cosmetic clinic, they do a lot of laser work, right? They're they're bringing a laser over the the, the patient's body. It sometimes it's for tattoo removal. Sometimes it's for rejuvenation. What have you? Um, 
that's a control <coughs> process, right? If you go too much, you burn the skin. If you go too little, you don't do what you're trying to do. You know, that, things like that maybe you know might come down the road. It's still basically a motion and positioning problem. Standard robot or CNC yeah. type of. A yeah. Yeah, I think the, the sort of the, the difference in the robots is is maybe from the standpoint of like like I think that Mako is a good example is, um, for example, our system, um, you know, there's a, a feature where the physician actually can move the robot. We actually have a six degree of freedom force support <laughs> sensor uh, in the you know in the load cell built into the system. So all you have to do is hold down a button, grab the robot, and it moves around like it's part of that. And they can move it to the patient. They can move it away. So they're in control of the process. They're in control of the procedure, the pace. They can do that at any time if they want to bring it away, get some access, come back in. You know. So when you're grabbing a follicle, uh, it's got a hair in it, right? That's right. Is the hair long or short at that point? Uh, we we sell the the pre the pre op procedure is we need one millimeter out of the skull. So we crop whatever it is with long hair. It's going to get cropped down to one millimeter buzz cut. And uh, that you, you're basically the, the stereo cameras are finding those. those they see those because you've got you know we've got two sets of stereo cameras actually. One's a wide angle view, one's a near field view. And the near field view is where you, know, you can see at such a high resolution. And you can see the base of the hair. You can see it's coming out. Hairs don't grow in singles. They do something well not all the time. Sometimes they grow in bunches of three. We get three at a time. Sometimes we get four. It's part of the system's control process. Power they give the physician is giving them the ability to. Oh, that's a four. I need some. I need fours because we're going to be implanting towards the back of the head, which is where, where you have the denser hair plant. Whereas you get singles towards the front. That's more natural. You guys look for test subjects. We do. I, I, I was actually I was actually uh, uh, running a case uh, today up in the North Bay. So we we this <laughs> many a graft were extracted today. <laughs> does, does, the the robot robot on the, does the extraction of the wing implant? No, the, the implant is part of our, our roadmap. Um, it's a different process. It's a it's a it's a it's a planning process because you got to involve the patient heavily with the planning of where you want it, what you want to look like. <laughs> do, you, uh, do you use software to give yourself like even distribution of harvesting there? Or is yes. That yes. Did so you like once you core it out, you <laughs> <laughs> once you core it out, you put it back. Place right away, or do you see no, not right away. So what you do is you you take um, you know the graphs and we store them on cold saline, and the 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 robot today is a harvesting system. It's doing the most difficult part of the process, which is the dissection. It's it's getting it so you don't damage the follicle, uh, and minimum damage, minimum trauma to the follicle, and then a technician will just grab it with a force set and place it in a cold petri dish. And it, she can actually do that while the case is running. Do they grow back? No. So the, the core, the, the key to hair growth is there's some glands around the hair. We could actually get a core, you know, possibly without a hair in it. Uh, hair could reform in there because there's some uh, glands around that hair follicle for the reason it grows, not necessarily the hair itself. It forms a root, there's a cavity for the root, and there's glands that support the growth of that hair that pops up through the skin. Any further questions? So if, if you, <laughs> I, I didn't think to mention this, but you, you can go to our, our, our website if you are, uh, we do have information about making contact about uh, things like, you know, going to do a trial. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, it's a clinical trial, I'll just say that. If we interview you, that's, yeah. we'll, we'll explain all the details. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much. Thank you.